So today we're going to have a conclusion class for the course. Um, we're going to speak briefly about um, the advances in terms of the web of data, how it's advanced and um, how it hasn't advanced, where it's being used and why and, and where it's not being used and why not. So as an overview of the of what we've seen in the course in terms of technical concepts, we've seen how to publish data on the web using RDF, uh, how to describe the semantics of the terms used in the data using um, using OWL or RDFS. Uh, in this case, it's expressed as rules, but we saw how to express this using uh, ontologies, how to write queries in Sparkle and receive answers directly in a structured format, how to specify links between documents on the web of data, such that if we're in this document here about Ireland and we uh, click on Dublin, we can receive some more data about that um, entity in RDF and regarding validation where we can uh, check to see to make sure that a document um, follows some expected structure um, using shackle or checks. So overall, um, I've been working on the semantic web for quite some time and I would say that um, the concept is, is starting to take off. So in, in a way, maybe that's different to what was originally envisaged, but for sure there's some adoption. Um, so about a year or so ago, I did a survey of the community, a questionnaire asking people what they thought were the some of the, the success stories of, of the area, the semantic web. Um, so we see some uh, tie cloud here of mentioning some of the, of the keywords that were mentioned by the different uh, people responding. Uh, we've schema.org, knowledge graphs, DBpedia, Wikidata, ontologies, bioinformatics, linked data, Google knowledge graph, uh, enterprises. Um, so we see a bunch of a bunch of concepts here, many of which we, we spoke about in the course, some of which we maybe didn't speak about in so much detail. Um, so one of the main ones that we we've seen a lot of in the in the course is Wikidata, um, which has been a very successful project. Um, it's in use now by a wide range of uh, end user applications, and it has very much the a lot of the concepts of the web of data um, inherent in the project. So in terms of using RDF and Sparkle and and linking data on the web. So in terms of its success, well, we could talk about success in terms of growth of the amount of knowledge that's been hosted there, uh, where it's, I actually, I think it's surpassed 1.2 billion uh, statements or individual claims about entities. So it's become this massive resource of, of data uh, on the web with lots of links to, to uh, other different uh, websites and giving IDs to other entities, uh, different, um, different data sets on the web. So another thing we spoke about or, or we saw in the type that was uh, schema.org, which is used for Google's rich snippets, where essentially Google knows about, you know, what is the rating, the reviews, the duration and the calories of a recipe because the people embed metadata into the recipe pages, um, providing this information. So this, this is using the schema.org vocabulary. So this has been quite successful. Also, uh, Google's knowledge panel, um, this is based on what's called Google's knowledge graph, which is essentially a collection of data in, in a graph structured format, which uh, Google is collecting um, based on the data is collected from the web from locations like uh, Wikipedia, Wikidata, and so forth. Um, so here we see in more detail, more information um, about uh, Sully Poitron, I guess, uh, who was born in France and where he died and what books he wrote and um, what awards he won. So again, this is powered by a lot of the data for particularly rich snippets and perhaps also for the, the knowledge panel come from the schema.org uh, proposal, which is a vocabulary where people can describe data or mark up their web pages with um, encodings like RDFA or microdata or JSONLD, which are essentially RDF. Microdata is not really in the RDF family, but it's kind of trivial to convert microdata to, to RDF um, in use by Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Yandex, um, and more besides. So, 
another uh, important usage of um, of data on the web uh, is Facebook's Open Graph, Open Graph Protocol, where essentially people often link to web pages in their Facebook posts. So the idea is that when someone links your page, you want to, you know, give some metadata in order to be able to tell Facebook how to display um, a preview of that page. So we see a Facebook post here, we see an IMDB link, and we see that there's an image, um, a title, and there's some comment. So essentially, this is controlled using metadata on the IMDB web page. Uh, it's quite shallow meta metadata for sure, but um, it's still uh, some structured data. In terms of how many people um, are publishing data on the web, how many websites are using RDF or related standards, uh, effectively, we could say that 59.1% uh, of uh, 60, 69.1% <laughs> uh, sorry, are using uh, structured data on their website. 69.1% of websites are using structured data formats. So um, what this means is essentially there is a wide range of different data formats that people are using. Um, the most popular one at the moment is Open Graph, which is the Facebook uh, standard. So about 60% of websites have some Open Graph metadata embedded into them, into their web pages. Uh, Twitter Cards is something similar to Open Graph, but it's essentially what Twitter wants you to put in to have a nice looking preview of your web page when someone posts a link uh, to one of your web pages on Twitter. Um, Jason LD. Um, is essentially JSON linked data. We spoke about in class two on RDF. It's essentially an RDF uh, standard. So it's essentially a JSON syntax where you can specify a context, which describes how to export that JSON data into RDF. Uh, generic RDF A, uh, as we mentioned in, a, in the second class on RDF as well, this is essentially a syntax of RDF that we can embed into uh, web pages. So it's used in about 32% of websites. Microdata, which is something similar again to RDFA, it's just another way of embedding data into uh, HTML. It's not really um, it's not really RDF as such, but it can be trivially converted to RDF. Dublin Core, which is essentially I, I'm not even really sure why it's it, that this uh, graphic here is mixing somehow vocabularies and syntax a bit because Dublin Core is often used with RDF. It's essentially a vocabulary for describing documents, and microformats is similar to microdata, just that it's usually particular to different to particular types of of data. In any case, we see that the concept of using or the idea of using data, publishing data or embedding data into web pages into websites is, is growing. So in terms of the growth, um, we see even from 2018 to, to, you know, to now effectively, um, that in general, the number of websites that um, do not have any metadata is falling sharply um, from 55% to 35%. So um, what that means is that the, the notion or the concept or the, the practice of embedding data into web pages, into websites is growing. Where we see the growth of Open Graph here, uh, Twitter card here. This is JSON LD, um, generic RDF A, and microdata. And another interesting aspect is that the use of RDF specific formats is growing. Just to mention that it essentially, um, Twitter, um, it uses RDF, but a very RDF light. It's the same for um, Open Graph. They both use a sort of a, a light version of RDFA, and they kind of made up their own thing. They made up their own syntax, but it's essentially very close to, to RDFA. So it's kind of a little bit frustrating that, uh, unlike in the case of schema.org, where you don't see it here because it's it just uses the standard syntaxes of the web, what was standardized by the W3C. So you can do it in JSON-LT or you can do it in RDFA. Uh, unlike schema.org, Twitter and Facebook just come up, came up kind of with some pseudo arbitrary proposal of a syntax, their own syntax and their own vocabulary, which is a little bit frustrating rather than following standards. So if you want to parse or use the data for, for Twitter, first of all, you have to use Twitter card for Twitter and you have to parse it 
Um, you have to have a special parser almost for, for Twitter data or for Facebook data, which is obviously not scalable. Um, but uh, they're essentially very similar to ODFA. Uh, so it's a little bit frustrating that they wouldn't just follow standards for which there's tools and, and specifications available. But in any case, um, so we have also Google's Knowledge Graph was released in 2013, um, or was announced at least in 2013. So uh, we saw on the Tag Cloud, there was mentions of Knowledge Graphs as being a, a major success of, of um, the semantic web. And there's a lot of interest now in Knowledge Graphs, which are essentially, it's a sort of a vague semi-marketing term for just having a graph of data, like RDF that represents knowledge and we, we can find um, knowledge graphs have been announced by Google, by Amazon, by um, Airbnb, by Uber. There are all sorts of industries that are describing how useful it is to represent knowledge or their data as a knowledge graph. And this is because with graphs, the schema is more flexible, so we can more easily integrate more data. Um, we have query languages where we can query the graph, and we can also apply graph algorithms over the graph, for example, to measure centrality using um, measures like page rank or to find paths or to find routes or to find connections between different users or different places. Um, so this concept is really um, picking up speed a lot. There's a lot of uh, industries, uh, enterprises interested in, in developing and using knowledge graphs as a more flexible way for managing their data. Uh, also, we've seen uh, increase and um, there's um, we've seen continual growth in in linked open data so I, I would say that you know this started in 2008 2009 2010 there was a lot of momentum around this and it started it slow a bit but there's still some some growth in terms of linked data where the idea is to use the semantic web standards and to to make sure that uh, to add links between RDF documents in order to create this uh, web of data based on, on the semantic web standards. So as we mentioned in the process, it's the five-star linking open data scheme where every additional step increases the value of data from using, um, uh, from publishing your data in an open license to making it machine readable to using an open format. For example, CSV is better than um, uh, an Excel spreadsheet to using URIs or IRIs to identify your entities, which allows them to be linked to or from um, different places on the web. And then to, to linked open data, which uh, includes this concept of making sure that your links are, your IRIs are dereferenceable. So when someone clicks on them, it brings you to the document on the web that describes that thing. Uh, so yeah, we've there are lots of data sets published uh, available on the web as, as linked data, linked open data. Um, so this has also been an important part of the success story of the semantic web. Uh, we also have lots of vocabularies published. So if we want to describe some particular types of entities, maybe you want to describe geographic data, or maybe you want to describe licensing data, or maybe we want to describe um, sensor networks, uh, sensors and so forth. We, we can find vocabularies for many different um, aspects for many different types of data that we might want to describe. Uh, and these are used by lots of websites. So the size of the circle here indicates how many different websites are, are using this vocabulary somehow. Um, aside from the kind of just open web, we see also, you know, use cases or success stories in different domains. So in terms of the use of ontologies, um, one core domain that has really made use of a lot of ontologies uh, is, the, is the area of biomedicine, uh, where we see a lot of biomedical ontologies. And of course, in, in these sorts of domains, they are very deep in, in terms of technical. There are lots of concepts involved, and there is a high need for precision. Um, which means that you know you, you don't want to be mistaken in terms of you know for example the notion of a cold uh, can refer to three or four different concepts um, and it can also depend on the on the area or the region so there's a lot of effort towards standardizing taxonomies and vocabularies relating to biomedicine 
uh, and these have been formulated then as um, ontologies in, in OWL or in OBO, uh, which is a, a similar uh, format. So these are quite um, important resources to be able to automatically in, uh, process and, and make entailments about different concepts in, in what is a very deep domain. So um, there's been quite a lot of success or an important application. This is one example of an important application of uh, OWL ontologies. So, you know, there's like 912, for example, in this bio portal, one can find 912 ontologies that describes, um, for example, Snow CT describes uh, clinical trials. See if I can recognize any more here. I can't, I'm afraid. I'm not sure what these ones are for. Um, so, um, yeah, so there's a lot of use of ontologies as well in the biomedical domain. Um, any questions or? Comments? No? Okay, so, yep. I have a question. Sure. That um, when you link, for example, something to um, Wikidata, for example, mm. Does Wikidata know it's being referenced? Um, that's a good question. Um, no. So in the in one of the in a version uh, of the web before the web, um, Tim Berners Lee had proposed a system inquire. I guess it was that required links to go in both directions. So just on the on the web, um, essentially, if you had a link going in one direction, there would be a backlink going in the other direction. So you could see what page is linked to the current page, right? Uh, and he found that the, it just required too much administration to try to keep this synchronized. So, you know, if you imagine on the web now trying to track all of the websites that link to Facebook on Facebook would just be a, a very difficult task. So, Directly in terms of the infrastructure, if there are links to Wikidata, do, do, does Wikidata know directly? No. Um, can Wikidata find out? Yes, uh, th there would be ways in which they could figure out who, who is linking to them. Uh, for example, this, this log cloud here tries to establish or to recognize which data sets link to which ones so they could check out which ones are, are linking to them on this uh, log cloud. Um, it's not part of the infrastructure, but there would be ways where we could develop systems uh, to at least capture some or most of the web of the websites or the data sets linking to a particular data set on the web. Um, do Wikidata need to know? Um, I'm not sure. Um, maybe, but essentially the consumers of your data set would welcome having links to Wikidata because now you, you can somehow ground the identity of the things you're talking about. But I mean, what I mean by that is, let's say you're talking about different places and I don't know, you're talking about Santiago, for example, um, and you, you just use the string Santiago or you just use a local identifier example.org slash Santiago. The consumer might have questions about what, what Santiago is this, right? But if you link it to Wikidata, then you somehow, you know, on Wikidata, you can find out more information that this is the cities in Chile, that it has a population of X, Y, Z in, in different years. So it allows the consumers to find out more information, but also to identify somehow the identity of this element can be linked with the, its description in other places on the web. For example, you can then know which Wikipedia article talks about this specific Santiago. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. Yes. It okay. Does. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Any other questions or doubts? So we spoke about the success stories, but I, I think it's, you know, uh, maybe early to celebrate. It's not really clear that the original vision of the semantic web has uh, you know, we haven't really seen the full potential or we still haven't realized the original vision of, of what the semantic web was, which is to be able to better automate complex tasks. When we spoke about how many websites are using 
um, are using embedding data into their web pages or websites. It's often for very simple, more or less trivial tasks, which are, you know is the sort of showing um, showing a nice snippet in Facebook or something in in Twitter, or you know. But it's still it's a start, especially at least with schema.org, where people are describing recipes and movies using different types of metadata. It's definitely progressing. So the use of um, the deeper kind of you know knowledge representation, ontologies, um, even links between different the data on different websites is still not really a mainstream concept yet. But um, and there's more uh, research is required to be able to to push forward on that. So we mentioned some of those um, research problems and the linked data class, just to briefly recap them, things like integrating diverse data. So when we have the descriptions of the same entity on different websites, how to know that we're really speaking about the same person, which is super important if we want to be able to integrate the data about, for example, in this case, Bill Clinton from DBPDF, Freebase, New York Times, and BBC. Um, so how can we integrate data using different identifiers from different sources? Also, how to integrate data using diverse vocabularies. So you might also encounter this during your projects where you have some data in your local vocabulary, uh, and then you want to integrate data from maybe from Wikidata and then, or from DPpedia. It's essentially, you know, or you have data that's described using Twitter card and open graph from Facebook and schema.org. And then you have to query that data and you have all these diverse vocabularies. So how can you query that data? Uh, it can be difficult if we're using diverse um, vocabularies, different namespaces in every document, right? So as we see here, um, so it's essentially a question of how can we integrate and write queries against linked data using different vocabularies. And the, the core uh, kind of direction thus far for the semantic web is to avoid this problem by agreeing on vocabularies and where there is some use of different vocabularies to use something like RDFS or OWL to describe relations or map between the different vocabularies. Uh, decentralized querying where we have data sets on some servers and we have uh, clients with queries and sometimes the servers can also have queries. So this idea of doing like putting databases on the web and then allowing the different databases to answer different parts of queries for, for arbitrary users is a really new idea. And it's, you know, there's some questions about how to scale this, how to make sure that we don't kill the server with complex queries. Um, so this, these sorts of questions are faced by Wikidata, for example. Um, so how can we enable decentralized querying over multiple de decentralized data sets? And there is a point here about how do we finance this as well? Like how, you know, what, how does the server pay for running the server? It just has a data set and answers queries. And okay, maybe there's some donations or something, but to scale this, uh, should it include adverts in the structured query results? You know, how, how what's what's the model? Should it uh, uh, charge per query? Um, there's questions about also the practical aspects of you know what what are the incentives for a server to to host a data set and to to uh, answer thousands of queries per second. There's also, of course, the open question of veracity on the web, which is certainly an unsolved problem on the traditional web, let alone the, as we now know with the misinformation, fake news and so forth. Uh, it can have, we can apply similar types of techniques to, to address this, this problem for the web of data. Um, but it's, it's somehow a little bit different in that in the semantic web, the web of data, we consider a lot of automated processing. So if we have incorrect or malicious data, this could somehow snowball into some very negative effects. For example, if we wanted to automatically plan a holiday and uh, we're booked into some tour that didn't exist or you know, some hotel that is just spam, it actually, the hotel doesn't exist or whatever, there's, you know, that, that could be an issue. Of course, the way to avoid that would be to use, you know, rating schemes, like when users are rating different providers, you can use centrality on the web to measure how influential a website is. Um, there are various ways to address this, right? But there's still research needed to see how to address this specifically on the, the web of data, semantic web. Uh, and legacy data. So we have all of this data in different formats. And in general, I would say that the experience has proved that RDF is a sufficiently flexible format to be able to represent data in, in, in different um, 
from different domains. The only thing it's, it's sort of not good for is representing things like uh, images or video, you know, directly image content or video content. It's not really designed for that, right? But in terms of the more descriptive uh, data formats, uh, things like SQL, JSON, XML, uh, CSV, even HTML or PDF, you know, these um, uh, annotated uh, text documents. Uh, RDF has proven to be a, quite a flexible um, format for representing these, but there's still a question of how can we quickly and easily export data from legacy formats into RDF, which is also something you'll probably encounter in the in the projects. Um, so another major, major, major aspect is the question of usability. So. Hopefully, during the course, you've gotten a, a flavor of the power of of the of you know standards like Sparkle being able to go to Wikidata and write Sparkle queries. You can get some uh, answers to some very interesting questions that might be of interest to a lot of users. But if the user doesn't speak Sparkle, if it, if the user can't actually express their Sparkle query, then they're going to be somehow excluded from that benefit. Um, and there's a question of, you know, how, how, how can you reach more users? How can you reach more users in a more equ equitable way? Um, you know, how can we enable uh, a wider range of users to be able to benefit from, from this technology? And that requires a lot of work in terms of usability. So in terms of not just in terms of like studying usability, but also creating interfaces that can help non-expert users to better interact with resources like uh, Wikidata or DBpedia or linked data, the linked data cloud or uh, whatever it might be. So this is also a major, I'd say, I would say one of the most important uh, research problems for the semantic web is to create interfaces that allow non-expert users to, non-expert users to, to use the semantic web and to benefit from it. So this is being a sort of a research area, you know, we don't have the answers for this. We have ideas, directions, there's definitely progress in all of these different dimensions. Um, but I think the, that the, they are interesting questions and the solutions to them could help to, to change the web. And the web is such an important resource that to be able to better manage and query data and integrate data on the web would be um, possibly of huge impact uh, so it seems that these are questions that are worth thinking about. Um, and yeah, so semantic web is also a, a topic of ongoing research in Chile. Uh, we had a, a nucleo um, a research group dedicated to the semantic web. This is now evolved into an institute more generally for data, Institute for Foundational Research and Data, Instituto Fundamental. Instituto Millennium Fundamentos de los Datos. Um, so there's a group of, of professors in um, La Universidad de Chile and La Católica that are working uh, actively doing research in the semantic web area, um, including myself. Um, so that's the course. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. You got some interesting concepts from it. Um, thanks for taking the course. Um, and I guess what's left of the course is mainly the, the projects. So in terms of the projects, as mentioned, we'll, uh, we can move to Discord and uh, we can have a Q&A session there. Um, any questions or comments? Okay, if not, uh, we can move to the Discord in case you have questions about the projects. So.